Uh, without further ado, our second speaker, uh, Miss Danielle Fitch. She can make her way to the stage. Uh, her title of her talk is Resilient, which is a play on words, and it's what champions are made of. I probably could have put down beauty and the business. We could have titled it uh, that because Danny's uh, definitely a rising star who's excelling in her chosen field and through many different fields. She wears many different hats. Uh, she's a 28-year-old qualified pharmacist. 29. 29. Sorry about that. Me medical science liaison officer in the field of oncology and beauty pageant director. So one day she'll be wearing the beauty uh, pageant director's hat and the next day she'll be having insightful conversations with leading specialists around Australia, convincing them and informing them of uh, new drugs within the field of oncology. So definitely uh, wears many different hats to, um, to obviously try and influence people. So Danny is the national director for both Miss Grand Australia and Fiji and founder of Rise Academy, the female empowerment and pageant training academy based in Sydney. She holds a Bachelor of Pharmaceutical Science, a Master's in Pharmacy, and works for Servia Laboratories as an Oncology Medical Science Liaison Officer. In 2015, Danny raised over 21,000 single-handedly for Variety, the children's charity. In 2016, she donated 1,000 items of compassion to the Beauty Bank for domestic violence victims. <coughs> and in 2017, facilitated, the ra and facilitated in raising over 18,000 for anti-human trafficking organisation Destiny Rescue in her first year of directorship. She's currently leading the Miss Grand Australia National Finalist fundraising efforts for UN Women National Committee in Australia. <coughs> so without further ado, I guess I'd like to um, let Danny share her story, but from both a personal and professional experience. Thank you, Mike. When I found out I was going after Chris Helder, I kind of I considered getting back in the car and leaving. Um, so I'm just going to add in a couple of jazz hands to make it exciting, but I'm definitely staying behind this lectern. So please forgive me, I'm not going to be as dynamic and interactive as uh, the wonderful Chris Helder. Um, so Chris R. Swindoll wrote, 10% of life is, sorry, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. And I always say that victim or victor really is up to you how you react to it. So just a little bit about myself. I know Mike has introduced me. My name is Danny Nicole Fitch. Danielle, if you're upset with me or if you're my dad. Um, I'm Miss Grand Australia 2016, so I was crowned two years ago as Miss Australia where I represented in Las Vegas and I was placed top 20 in the world. I am the managing director of not only Miss Grand Australia but also Fiji. I'm currently World Supermodel Australasia 2018. I'm the founder of Rise Academy, which I established in 2017. Basically, it's a platform for women to teach them that they can rise up no matter the situation that they've come from. I'm also an oncology medical science liaison, which means I look after oncology research pipeline. I'm an ambassador for the UN Women Australia, where I endorse and advocate for women's empowerment and equality within the workplace as well as in everyday life and eradicating domestic violence throughout Australia. I have studied a Bachelor of Pharmaceutical Science and Medical, also a Master's in Pharmacy, hence the chemistry analogy tonight, but I'm also a professional loser. But let me show you how you can rise and sparkle no matter your situation. So does anyone actually know what any of these women have in common? They're actually all beauty queens, and they're all incredibly successful in their fields now from their successful rise to resilience. So, I already mentioned I'm World Supermodel Australasia. I was Miss Grand Australia 2016. After winning, I went on to represent Australia, where I placed top 20 out of 86 countries, but my success was viewed by 1.6 billion viewers in the world. I then took over as National Director, where I'm now able to provide a platform for women, such as Miss Kimberly Gondani, who's in the audience tonight, um, a platform for humanitarian activities to share their messages of positivity and humanitarian efforts with the world. I established Rise Academy, as I mentioned, to provide a platform for women to come up and rise up from where they have come from, and together we actually raised $50,000 for UN Women Australia. Winning a beauty pageant and being a beauty queen is so much more than yielding a shiny crown. Crowns are made up more of metal and stones. Each stone represents a quality that makes her a queen. The metal is the grit that holds it all together in a nice, pretty, neat package. I know that you all see a crown and you think, princess. 
But you couldn't be more wrong. A crown is made up of perseverance, discipline, strength, courage. She who wears a crown is a damn queen. I would like to highlight another important element of not just beauty queens, but an element that is found in the core of winners, legends, champions, CEOs, sporting stars, researchers, world leaders, all harness and procure this element readily. So who here has studied chemistry? We have some students. Can I see a show of hands just so I can see if this is gonna land on anyone or not? Okay, two out of 100, that's great. Moving right on. Um, in total, I've studied approximately 20 chemistry subjects across my education. So I thought it'd be really fun to introduce a little pun fun, a little witticism, a little glitz, a little science into my talk. So who remembers the periodic table? Surely, you haven't lived in a cave. Fantastic. 118 elements, which constitute the ordinary matter of the universe, 94 of which occur naturally, 24 synthetic, iron the most abundant in the mass of the earth, and uh, oxygen is the most common element in the Earth's crust. Well, scientists have recently discovered another element. So it cannot be synthetically manufactured. It exists in nature, by nature, for nature. Some say it behaves like elastin, but it does not lose its stretch with time. Instead, it strengthens, but it doesn't harden. It bounces like a ball, but it's not composed of atoms, electrons, or neutrons, or matter, although ironically for success, it does matter. It's rich in the poorest communities and somewhat poor in the richest. So what do you actually think it is? Resilient. It took me about half an hour to make this, so please appreciate it. <laughs> okay, truth be told, I made it up, but I'm a chemist, so I'm going to roll with this incredibly nerdy concept that I've come up with to describe the human condition that is resilience. Winners are resilient. As George M. Moore Jr. says, a winner is just a loser who tried one more time. And as I said, I'm a professional loser and I don't take no for an answer. I mentioned earlier that I'm a professional loser, but something that champions are well accustomed to is failing. Failing often, failing well. There's no greater learning or humbling experience than losing. All humble champions have a grounding point but with every fall that presents the opportunity to rise. I have this sick tendency to throw myself into very public displays of failure. I've done a lot of failing in a very public way, almost like I felt like, like I was naked in front of an audience, which I feel in my opinion gives me a pretty good leg to stand on when I say that resilience truly is what makes up champions. So my first public humiliating failure was in 2012. I was studying a master's in pharmacy, and I decided that Miss Universe Australia sounded like a really great idea. Um, science and medicine is super dry. I thought, you know, it sounded tantalizing, it sounded exciting, so, you know, in I dove. That's when it began. I made it to the state finals, and as you can see, I was a bit of a tragedy. And I was actually publicly and very shamefully called a public humiliation, and called a tragedy in front of everybody, which I was because, I mean, look at the fashion faux pas. I'm wearing a black belt, gold buckles, silver necklace, silver earrings, nude shoes. The dress is too short. It was just tragic. So I didn't make it through, obviously. 2015 rolled around, and I'd relocated to Sydney for work. Thank you, Servia Laboratories. Um, and as moving cities with no support network to start a completely new job, which I had no idea how to do, uh, wasn't stressful enough, I decided that, you know what, I'm going to give it another crack. It didn't hurt enough the first time. So I was in search of purpose. I wanted to fill a void in my then somewhat successful life. Uh, I was placed actually first runner-up nationally for, in the Beauty with a Purpose segment where I raised $21,000 for Variety the Children's Charity. And I actually didn't even place top 15, even though 30% of the total score was based on this charitable component and most people probably would have fallen over and had a bit of a cry, but it didn't really matter to me. A fire had been ignited in me, and I would stop at nothing, win or lose. I was not going to stop until I could fulfill this purpose. So, obviously, 2016, gave it another crack, entered Miss Grand Australia, and I won the bloody thing. I had lost time and time again, but it never stopped me. I picked myself up, I shook off the glitter, and I shook off the trolls, and there were a lot of trolls. Uh, and I went back for more because that's just what winners do. They don't send out pity party invites. They don't drink crap wine. 
Uh, I did do this in 2012, however. They choose victor over victim. They recover, they regroup, they re-strategize, and they come back for one more time. So in order for you to appreciate my very public resilient rise, uh, you must first understand my very private fall into darkness. And in the nature, it, it, it takes a lot for somebody to stand up and be vulnerable in front of a crowd of strangers, but I do have some people here who know me quite well. Um, I've never shared my story publicly, uh, only with some very close friends, so please um, don't throw anything at me. When a tragic or undesirable event steals the air from your lungs or oxygen from your hypothetical Earth's crust, resilience is that willpower to suck it up. The voice in your head that whispers to you, breathe, without oxygen, you'll probably die. It's both a push and a pull. The most resilient have experienced the most adversity. It poses clarity in hindsight, yet it's often hidden in darkness as it rises. I always imagined that this element, resilience, would exist in abundance somewhere above storm clouds in the outer hemisphere, but it doesn't. It's found in all of us, inert, waiting to be harnessed. All that you need is a catalyst. Well, my life has been an absolute roller coaster ride. I'll share a few stories, probably not all of it, but just the pivotal ones. Over 29 years, I've lived in 30 homes. The early years of my life were spent in a very violent household, a couple of stints in safe refuges as my family played this really sick game of emotional tug and war. Then the following years I spent in a solicitor's office. As a little girl, I remember having a mother one day, then being told that I'll never see her again the next. I was fed so many versions of the story intertwined with the muffled memories of a lot of sadness, a lot of violence, cars taking off in the middle of the night, and many years of hate, manipulation, and resentment, which only really came to light in the last few years. The following six years were spent living with a stranger who made it abundantly clear that she wasn't much of a fan of me, uh, three years of which I got to see my dad once every six or so weeks as he tried to battle avoiding bankruptcy due to the divorce. The following five years I spent very privately depressed uh, because I wasn't entirely sure who I could confide in as a young person. I was confused about my identity because I had so much turbulence and change with minimal guidance or reassurance. Uh, my dad, I don't know if any of you know him, he's a real tough nut, old school kind of Aussie guy whose mentality is suck it up, she'll be right. So I had so much anger, and for a while there, I did sort of keel over and play victim. Um, until I discovered how to harness resilience. And subconsciously, I established a five-step system. I didn't realize it at the time, uh, but it actually saved my life. I found out a few, day, uh, a few years later I found out a few years later that my mum was battling a brain tumour, quite an aggressive one. There was a really large mass on her brain stem. They started intensive chemo straight away, they cut out what they could, and my dad did what he thought was best, and basically they just told me she died. I found out years later that it was a lie. And that was that. I went into a deeper, silent type of struggle again, and I have mountains of letters to verify that for a very, very long time, um, I was deeply depressed. And this event was what triggered my very first true dip into darkness. But this is how I used to cope. I used to write. I wrote lots of stories, poems, letters, um, anything to lighten the load of a heavy heart. I won awards for some of the things that I wrote. Um, and when my mother actually did die, um, I left them on her coffin and it was, it was very cathartic for me. But I was okay, I dug deep again inside for that little nugget of resilien, resilium, and I used my five steps, which I'll discuss shortly. I let it take the reins for a while. I found my way through the darkness, through university, into a strapping new career, and just as I got to the real top of that roller coaster, I get a call from my dad, and he's had a heart attack. Great. I literally negotiated my salary and contract from the emergency room. I think they thought I was trying to hustle a better salary, but I legitimately was whispering in, in, from the hallway, copping dirty stairs from the cardiac nurses. I was as worried as I was about my dad, he was fine. A little post MI depression, he disappeared on me again for a, on the road for a year, but back on the road to recovery. And an opportunity came up at my company again, as I mentioned, so they moved me to Sydney to become the cardiovascular specialist of, of anything. 
And just as the roller coaster tipped over to the top, I moved to Sydney, and I kid you not, this all happened in the space of a few weeks in 2015. My mum actually died, so I found out she was alive when I found out she died. So that was really confusing. Um, my long-term partner, who was supposed to meet me at a Thai airport, didn't turn up, just stood me up. And a week later, turned up at my door to take his things and left. I got served an eviction notice. This is the same week. I served an eviction notice with 14 days to vacate, so I had to choose between going to my mother's funeral and moving my things out of my apartment. My friend, who always experienced migraines, checked herself into a hospital complaining of severe migraines, worse than ever. She had a brain aneurysm. She died 24 hours. Her funeral was the same day as my mum's. And so there I was, standing at this crossroads, and I just I had to choose a path. Where was I going to go from here? And I could have resumed that role of victim well. I had walked the familiar streets. I had the costume. I had the wig. I knew all the lines. I was good to go. But I'd chosen a long time ago to stop feeling sorry for myself. Something had clicked and I realised life had presented me with this opportunity to be resilient, to be strong, to be a victor. You are not where you are and you are not who you were. You're a reality of where you are going and who you want to be. But you need to make those critical choices to determine the path that you take. 2015 was my most life-defining year. It didn't happen overnight, it wasn't a smooth ride, and I definitely relapsed a few times, but it was most certainly the beginning of a new direction away from who I didn't want to be. It appears that the years of heartbreaks, setbacks, failures, knockdowns, disappointments, rejections, had caused this resilient element to multiply in me. It was in my every cell, it was everywhere. I was resilient and I am resilient. It was a choice that I made. I was done with self-sabotaging behaviors and indulging that lingering feeling of abandonment and rejection. I made the choice that despite the cards that I had been dealt, I was going to create the life that I had always imagined. I set out to acquire my own cards, better cards, create my own luck and create my own happy ending. Just because life played out like this twisted Cinderella roll, it was really up to me to say, suck it up, princess. The life you always imagined is, a, is just waiting for you. This isn't it for you. There could be so much more. Which brings me to my five-step strategy. And I didn't know that this was what I was doing, but subconsciously I came up with these coping mechanisms. So arise. The verb, it actually means to get up, when sometimes it would feel so much easier just to lay down and play dead. So A. Acceptance. R, responsibility. I, identify your goal. S, stay positive and smile. And then Chris Elder said, positivity doesn't work. I was like, well, great. And you just completely screwed my acronym. <laughs> Thanks, Chris Elder. And E, exercise. So let's go into a bit more detail. A, acceptance. Accepting the situation for what it is, and this is something that Chris and I agree on, is it, it's the reality. It is what it is, and it's my favorite quote. The sooner that you accept situations for what they are, sooner rather than later, it will ensure that you can move forward sooner. I love the saying that it is what it is because you can't change what you cannot control. Death, loss, natural disasters, traffic, negative Nellies. You can't control these things, they just happen. It is what it is. So the sooner that you face that fact and accept it, for what it is, the sooner you can worry more about things that are in your control, like your own attitude. Responsibility. I am responsible for my own happiness and my own success. The fruits of tomorrow grow from your choice to go out and plant the seeds today. What choices are you making today that will affect your future happiness? Are your choices toward or away behaviors? Are they helping or hindering your goals? Are they comfort decisions or are they, sorry, comfort decisions or constructive decisions? You must choose the life that you lead based on the choices that you make every single day and then you need to take responsibility for the consequences of those choices. Make sure that they are in line with your goals and your purpose. Identifiable goals, so where are your goalposts? 
If you don't identify your goals, your reasons, and your purpose, why do you get out of bed? How do you aim for goalposts that you haven't drawn out? I'm a football player, so I'm obsessed with goalposts and every analogy to do with football, so that would be for another talk. How do you know if you have fallen or risen if you don't have your baseline or your stretch? Have you clearly defined what it is that you want to achieve this week or this month or this year? What have you got to be resilient for? What do you get out of bed for? For some of you, it's your children. For others, it's your career. For me, it's often food. Defining your goals gives you something, which I'm still hangry, by the way. Defining your goals gives you something to strive for, thrive for, and live for. Smile and stay positive, despite what Chris Helder says. A negative mind never gives you a positive life. Does your attitude reflect or bring out the best or the worst that's in you? Would you like you in your current state of reactivity? That's my football team. They're a bunch of hooligans. And exercise. Keep moving. I have this saying, if it's got legs, to describe the reason why I do so many things. If you're not moving, breathing, shifting, changing, well, you're probably dead. So it's kind of counterproductive to success. So I'm a loser. Yeah, I said it. I'm a proud loser, though. Don't care. But you know what? There's beauty in the breakdown. There are critical learnings in failure. There is so much grace in the rise. And I encourage you all to lose, fail, fall. It's all a part of the resilience exercise. And it's up to you how you react to it. If you're going through tough times, have you ever asked yourself what you're made of? Have you accepted hard, inalienable truths to begin your recovery process? Acceptance. Is your reaction to setbacks allowing you to make choices today for a better tomorrow? Identify your goals. Have you clearly identified your reason to rise up and try again? And are you keeping a positive, constructive frame of mind to help not hinder your rise to success? Or are you being stagnant? Or are your legs, in every sense of the word, still moving? Ooh, go back. So the final catalyst in the chemical reaction required to procure re resilience is you. You have the choice to react or retreat. You have the choice to bow down or buck up. You have the choice to be a victim or a victor. No one and nothing else but you. So take some responsibility. So this is my family, my papa. This is my little niece, and this is my, fam my siblings. So life truly is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. Because if you look at the history of my family, we could have just laid down, but we embrace each other now, we love each other, we support each other, and we're all successful, happy stories. Winners always choose to rise. If you ask for strength, life might not grant you with muscles from the outset, but maybe the opportunity to, to grow stronger than you were. It's a choice driven by your attitude. Lay down and die or rise and conquer. Resilience is a choice that I make in reaction to every setback in my life, not just tragedy. Resilium, it's in beauty queens, but not just them. It's the core of champions. It's inside all of us, inert. Harness it and rise up to a higher you. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Uh, put your hands together again for a fantastic role model for young women and a very clever presentation.